Hello, everybody. This is Jake Senziano, host of the Jake and Gino podcast here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father, six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy. Gino Barbaro, Gino, how's it going? Jake, you got your fall colors on. You're looking good. Technology's working today. As our guest said, it's a miracle that all three of us are on this call right now. So let her rip, baby. Always making it happen, big man. Today's guest is G. Edward Griffin. He is the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, classic, and the founder of Freedom Force International. So without further ado, Edward, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. It is our pleasure to have you. Let's dive into the book. Why did you write the book specifically? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I don't think anybody ever asked me why I wrote it. Okay, I guess the truth is I, I'm not sure. Uh, I had a lot of motives, I'm sure. First, I decided... Uh, I was going to just uh, do a documentary film on this thing called inflation. That never happened, but I did a lot of research. Mm -hmm. And then I got invited to give a speech on the topic, and that was a great success. So I was encouraged to go on the, on the road with a speech. And all the while, I'm still learning about this thing called the uh, Federal Reserve System. Mm -hmm. And uh, cut this real short, I know we don't have all day, but after about two years of that sort of thing, uh, putting on full day seminars on a crash course on money and all that. I realized that I was kind of a fraud uh, because um, people would always ask me at the end of these seminars, well, okay, if all this is true, what do you recommend that I do with my savings? Or uh, do I, should I, should I go into debt or get out of debt? My husband has died, left me with a small amount of money and I, I want to protect it from being eaten up by inflation or something. What should I do? And I had no idea what to do. I knew all about the Federal Reserve, or a lot about it anyway, mm -hmm. but I, I was a fraud because people thought I knew everything about everything. That would make every teacher a fraud then because you know you have every teacher out there can, can spew on economics, but do they really know what to do when it comes down to real business? Yeah. I don't know if you were a fraud. Maybe you were just a teacher. Yeah, well, I was a teacher on my little narrow topic. So I quit that and I, I enrolled in um, what's called the College for Financial Planning and got my CFP designation which is a certified financial planner, not because I wanted to be a financial planner because I didn't, but I wanted to know about those things. So mm -hmm. I came out of that with a lot more realistic knowledge about the real markets and all that sort of thing. And that's when I decided, hey, this is a huge topic. Maybe I should write a book about it. So it was never my decision uh, to do it. It was just something that crept up on me. And finally, I realized that I amassed all this information and I had amazed myself at every step of the journey. And I thought, you know, people should know about this. So that's when I, I made the really stupid mistake and decided I would write a book about it, not having any idea how difficult that would be on this topic. And that was the beginning of a seven-year journey of further research and writing. And finally, it came out the other end, and I had this monstrous book, this 600-page uh, doorstop. And uh, I thought, nobody's going to read this thing. And I had bought a lot of books because none of the major publishers wanted to publish it. So I thought, I'm going to publish it myself. That was another mistake. And uh, so I wound up with a garage full of books. And uh, I thought to my wife, I said to her, my God, we got, what have I done? You know, I've got all these books and all this time, and nobody's going to read it. Well, I was wrong. I don't know what happened, but uh, I, I just promoted it to the people on my mailing list. There were a couple hundred people. And they were anxious to buy the book. And then they started to sell the book for me. They, they were recommending it to their friends and all that. And the first thing you know, here we are a lot later, 21 years later or so. And uh, it's, I think it's in the 87th printing and the fifth edition. And it's uh, sold about a million copies and we've never advertised it. So wow. it just, uh, no, that's beyond the question of why I wrote it. The truth is, I don't know. It's just something I got into and I, I couldn't let go of it. It was just, it captivated me. So Griffin, you've written a ton of books, World Without Cancer, More Deadly Than War, Capitalist Conspiracy. What book is, which one is your favorite one that you wrote? My favorite? Probably The Creature. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think of that because the, it's my favorite because it awakened me. It's, it's a short, it's a short uh, first to the second one, which is World Without Cancer, because both of those books were something that I knew nothing about when I started that research journey. Mm -hmm. And those topics were perhaps two of the most important topics that you could possibly know about mm -hmm. uh, to, to know what the world is really like and to, to live in a, uh, a secure space in the world. You have to know about your health. Mm -hmm. You have to know about money. And what, what is more important than that? Well, plenty of things, I suppose, but those are very, very, very important. They're and so they're, they're out there. I mean, everything you do, I mean, if your health is no good, what good is your liberty? If you don't have freedom, what good is your health? You know, those two are intricately uh, combined together. And, uh, and then- If you're not free, what good is money, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, if you're not free, you don't have any, first of all. <laughs> I love that. What were you awakened to? You said you're awakened when you started writing these books. What was the awakening? 
Well, generically, the, the awakening was that the world is not as it appears to be. I was so naive. I came through, I came through the school systems, you know, I believed everything I was taught, everything in the books and everything the teacher said, well, this is the truth. Otherwise, I wouldn't be going to school uh, to learn it. And I never questioned it. And I was taught to respect authority and never question authority. I, I had to follow the rules, be a team player. And, you know, I believe that, that I was taught that the group is more important than the individual that the individual must be sacrificed if necessary for the greater good of the greater number. So I was indoctrinated into the system of collectivism and didn't know any of that. So the, the thing that was the greatest awakening across the board is that once you peel off this surface uh, picture of something very important in your life, like, like the healthcare system or the educational system mm -hmm. or the monetary system, these are vital aspects in your life. Once you peel off the picture that's glued over the top of it and look underneath and you see it's an infestation of corruption. That's what motivated me. I thought, wow, I didn't know this. They kept it from me and I was too stupid to realize it, you know, but naive. And uh, so anyway, that's it. It just it rang a bell. I guess I discovered that I had a crusader gene. I didn't know anything about that prior because I was all wrapped up in myself and my career, my family, which is family is good, but I didn't see anything outside of my little narrow world. And once I realized that I was part of the world and part of the community, part of humanity, I realized that I had a responsibility to, to earn that status. Mm -hmm. I was given certain advantages and gifts and, and I had to pay back in some way and, and earn my keep for being even alive. That's when I discovered something about me that I didn't know I had, which I jokingly call my crusader gene. But I think we all have that deep inside of us. So the, all of, when all of that's caught fire, I was on a path that was bigger than me. I had no control over it. I was impelled and compelled to do all of these things like take on a seven-year project to write a book I knew nothing about to start with. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like being a farmer. You plant crops and you never know if the crops are going to grow or burn down or, or, or be killed because of lack of water. So everything is at risk. And if you have a couple of crop failures, you're really in, in trouble. Well, writers are pretty much like that. Yeah. You, you can write a book. And if it's, if it's a crop failure, nobody buys it. Uh, you've just wasted a couple of years of your life. Uh, but anyway, that's the life I chose. Ed Edward, I, I want you to hold there for a second, because so many times we get focused on our careers. Gino and I are, are multifamily investors. We invest in, in buy apartment buildings. But then we see these, these social issues and some of these things going on economically that I feel sometimes compelled to speak about. But at the same time, there's all this cancel culture stuff that's going on. And there's repercussions sometimes if you speak out. And I know you've, you've dealt with that in your career. Was, is it worth it? And is, do you feel the reward for standing up and standing out? Because Gino and I have talked about this many times where sometimes we feel compelled that should we speak up about this? Should we say something? And, and it's sometimes you hold back or you, you really don't you know, live to your true self because of this cancel culture that's been created out in society today. So I'd love it if you could just touch on that a little bit. Well, I think everybody has to answer that question for themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think you've already answered it because you said you felt compelled. Yeah. And that's the same thing that drove me on. And I think if yeah. you feel it, then it's true. It's there. And that's your crusader, Gene. You know, yeah. this things are not right. And therefore, you have a responsibility. It's not really a choice. It's yeah. not a good choice. If you decide against what you know you have to do and should do, even a consequence, great consequence, then you denied something very, very intrinsic to you. Because I do being. feel fortunate that I have the opportunity to be in this position and in this country and have the opportunity for an at-bat at abundance and, and the lifestyle that mm -hmm. you know yeah. the country has provided. So and that's yeah. what I meant when I said payback. I mean, we do. It have, really struck me when you said that. That's yeah. what I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. That, so you feel it. You've got that gene too. And I think most people do. But you know, one of the great things about crises and tragedies and that's a funny thing to start off with. One of the great things <laughs> about a tragedy and a crisis is that it forces us to realize our full potential. If we didn't have challenges and, and great problems in our lives, we probably would never rise to our potential. We'd mm -hmm. drift along with the current. We would never learn to swim if we were on a raft forever in the stream. But if the raft sinks, we learn to swim. Well, now we're stronger. We're better than before. We can survive better. So in a way, I think that's part of the life cycle. We have to overcome obstacles. So when an obstacle comes in front of us, and it's truly important, it's not just because a, a tree fell across the road, but because a, an idea has fallen across our country, this idea of collectivism and you know, sacrificing individuals for this thing called the state 
or whatever they want to call it, the group, that that is serious. So, and, and people that feel compelled to do it will do it. I mean, I, I speak from experience. I had no desire to become a crusader or be looked at uh, by my neighbors as some kind of a, a tinfoil hat guy or a, a weirdo. <laughs> and uh, no, that didn't feel good. But I, it's, I got used to it real fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so if the shoe fits, maybe I should still wear the hat, right? <laughs> yeah. I've often thought about getting one just to make it, to finish the picture. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, Edward, I got six kids and we homeschool. So I've been wearing that hat and those shoes for a long time now. So I'm one of those guys who's outside the box and all. Let me ask yeah. you about this current pandemic. What has really enraged you or angered you the most over these past 18 months to two years that you've seen unfold and how they've utilized this it is probably it is a tragedy. I'm not saying it's not, but what have you what has gotten you the most mad? Well, I can certainly share your concern over that because that is it's very frustrating and, and disturbing to see how easily so many people are manipulated and allow mm-hmm. themselves to be manipulated. But then I have great empathy because I remember back when I was in that category. I mean, I had no knowledge to do anything else. I because I believed everything I, I saw on television. I believed everything if they I tell you it enough times marketing works, right? Oh, marketing mm-hmm. works. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll convince you, you, you need that uh, rotten uh, orange. Uh, so, yeah. and you, yeah, it, it's a status symbol. Oh, you know, you think they can convince you of everything. If they can convince people to, uh, and, and that's not so bad. It's, you know, we all, all of us, we do things because they're fashionable and because that's the trend. Mm-hmm. I, I, I do too. I mean, look, I wear clothes like everybody else. I don't wear necessarily what I want to wear because if I did, I'd probably lock me up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I'm not. I don't. I don't mean to be uh, overly uh, judgmental on anybody because they want to wear a tattoo. Because some of them are quite attractive. I have to admit. Uh, but anyway, but they can convince people to do that. I, I was. I've never so appalled when when they got this uh, this movie actor, big hunky guy, to wear earrings, and all of a sudden, all the kids were wearing earrings. You know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then a, no, a ring through your nose and all these things. I saw how easy it was using popular media and culture to change the culture, especially mm-hmm. young, among young people who haven't yet discovered who they are or what mm-hmm. they are. Mm-hmm. So uh, anyway, back to your question, what has angered me the most is not that. It's the, you said they're moving the goalposts. That's true. But what angers me the most is the goal itself. Mm-hmm. If we look beyond the goalposts and see what's behind them and where they really are going with all this, it's horrible. Mm-hmm. It is something the world has never seen before. It is the end of literally the end of humanity as we know it. It's called transhumanism. They're putting stuff into bodies that are going to change the the DNA characteristics of the human being, that it will be transmissible genetically from one generation to the other. Once it's in the genome, you can't take it out. They're literally trying to re-engineer the human being. And that is what first it scared the heck out of me as it should. But then it made me very, very angry that these people are allowed getting away with it because they are in control. And that angers me too, that how did these gentlemen and ladies uh, get into these position, positions of such power and authority? Well, I know how, but it, that makes me mad. It makes me very, very, very mad. And I ha- sometimes I have trouble keeping the lid on, on that because I know that when, in my case anyway, once I really get mad, I start making all kinds of mistakes. So that's my answer to your question. It's the goal itself. The goalpost can be moved all over. It's a game, but the ultimate goal is fixed. They want an end to humanity. Why do we become so obedient though? Yeah. That's the thing that I'm shocked is that so many people are just going along with it. And then it actually, to your point about the nose rings and the earrings, the mask is now a status symbol that shows how leveled up mentally and how woke and mm-hmm. elevated you are. Mm-hmm. So if you wear that, and maybe you didn't succeed in high school, and maybe you didn't succeed in college, but if you wear a mask, that's your status symbol now. Mm-hmm. So it's that's the stuff that I, I just don't I don't understand. And I just don't understand why so many people have laid down like they have and have just been taken this. Well, I don't really understand it either. But I understand part of it. I, I know that the human mind and the I guess the mind is the best word I can think of at the moment. The uh, human consciousness is made up of a lot of different components. Part of it is intellect, part of it is training, and part of it is genetic. And we have instincts, and uh, those instincts are very deep. For one of them, for example, we have a herd instinct. We're like a lot of other animals. It just comes with the box. It's in the box when we're born. And it's, it's there for a reason. Like most animals, they travel in groups in order to protect the weak 
and the old uh, from the predators. If they're in a group, you can defend the weak and the old, the weak from the predators better. And so we all have this instinct to cluster together. We live together and all of that. But then that instinct can be played upon by psychologists, I guess, who have studied the art of opinion engineering and, and um, attitude engineering and lifestyle engineering. And they have made an art out of it as a science, I suppose, started as an art, then it's a science now. People like Edward Bernays writing his books on, on how to um, program human beings, intelligent human beings to be programmed to buy uh, commercial items that they don't really want or need, but just how do you get people to do it? You already mentioned that repetition is one of those things. Status is another one of those things. The herd instinct is another one of those things. You want to be part of the group. You want to be accepted. You don't want to stand out. You don't want to be, you don't want to be. Uh, but how do we drift so far from the Boston Tea Party to this obedience culture? I don't get it. Well, actually, those, those instincts were always within us. And yeah. I'll, I'll bet you that all of the things I just mentioned were actually at play at that time, but they weren't dominant. They weren't, they weren't, uh, institutionalized. They didn't have they, the medium of the internet. They didn't have the through. medium and yeah. they didn't, they didn't offer college degrees on how to use that. Uh, it's a, it's an art now, a science. It's a, it's a curriculum. You can science go to school. Yeah. You can go to school and spend four or eight or 16 years constantly studying the finesse of this art, this art or this science. And so if we come out, we're dealing with experts. They know how to manipulate our minds. And if we're not careful, if we don't know what they're trying to do, we're all susceptible to it. I mean, you just take a look at advertising. Modern advertising gives you an example of what can be done. And they use this in the political area as well, or the social arena as well, and the economic. And they use it everywhere on us. So it is, I don't think it's, a, we drifted into it. It was always there. But what's the difference is that, um, we, we're dealing now with an organized, institutionalized profession that ha, makes that thrives on that. And they've decided they're going to use those tools of human control to create an absolute master-slave relationship. And that's what they're doing. It's pretty simple. It's These guys yeah. are crazy with power. And they think, you know, we could they control. Are, they are drunk on power. They're drunk on power. Hard. And it's not a mystery because we have that inside us that make it relatively easy for a professional to pry into our brains and into our attitudes and alter them if we're not aware of what they're trying to do. So that, my next question would be, we've had the doom and gloom, but like you said, there's always an opportunity on the other side. So what's the opportunity for all of us, for everybody listening to the show right now? What can we do collectively to start to triumph and to start? Thank you. You said the that's the issue. The, the collective is the issue there, Gino. It sounds like. But I'm saying us collectively, <laughs> but us collectively who have the mindset to say this is not for us because we see what's going on. What yeah. can we do? How can we take that power back? What is our next steps that we should be taking? Yes, I thank you for asking that question because that is probably the most important one for us right now. Mm -hmm. But before I do, I'd like to comment on that little side note about collectivism and collective action and so forth. Mm -hmm. There's quite a difference between the two. They sound alike, yes. but there's nothing wrong with collective action. We do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You and I are, are operating in a collective action right now, but collectivism is a whole different animal. That's what I was referring to. Yeah, so yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's just for the sake of the audience, because there's a, it's a point of confusion. We say we're against collectivism, but we, then you advocate that we all come together and collectively do something. And so it's important to know that the different shading on those words, collective action is, is a natural, uh, again, it's part of our instinct. It's also necessary for us to survive. We can't do everything alone. We have to work collectively with other people, but we do so voluntarily in a free society. Collectivism is the same thing, except there's no voluntary action. It's all compulsory. It's all coercion. You will do this or you will be punished. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, just because I'm an individualist doesn't mean I have to move my piano alone. I can call my friends and say, hey, would you like to come help me? And I'll, we'll have pizza or something. You know, that's fine. That's, collect, that's collective action. That's part of the higher instincts that man has. But collectivism is where some, some jerk comes along and says, I know better. I've been to school. I've read books. I know that you need to be protected against yourself and I'm going to do it whether you like it or not. And you will do this because it's good for you. You know, that's what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the difference it's, between it's it's an, it's obey do what I tell you to do versus a voluntary division of labor. 
Exactly. I think is what we're talking yeah. about. Yes. Difference between freedom and coercion. That's all. Yeah. So, but it's important because otherwise people get confused because they think because we are opposed to collectivism that we're opposed to working together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's not it at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the bright side of all this? What can we do? The most important thing? I think the most important thing right now is to get organized. We still have to spread the word. There's no question about that. Too many people are still in doubt. They don't have the facts. And that's sad. We have to educate people. But there are already, I believe, enough people out there that know what's going on. It only takes about 1% of the population really to start a movement mm -hmm. and 15% of the population to finish it. Our goal is 15% of the population to really know what's going on. The other 85% will never, ever do anything except follow the winner. Mm -hmm. And that's a fact. Now, that's another part of human nature. Some people just don't have the stomach for controversy or conflict. And so they will always follow the winner in any contest. That's encouraging because 15% of the population is, is a very attainable number. I think we've already reached that 15%. Mm -hmm. They're out there. I see it all the time. Uh, uh, six months ago, I go down the street. Everybody was staring at me uh, with you know, evil looks because I didn't have a mask on. Now I'm looking about half the people or more in some areas, nobody's wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. And even in those areas where they are, it's, you know, I'm smiling at them and they wave back. So people are aware now that that, that little important part of our, of our confusion factor of the, is our masks necessary? Is this pandemic real? That's already filtering out. People know now that there's something wrong with all of that. And more and more people are rebelling against all of this totalitarian stuff that's coming at them. We've reached the 15%. Now our job is to get organized. People in our category, we tend to think we're all alone. Oh my gosh, look on television. All they show is the other side. They don't show the grassroots out there, the 85% for sure that... Um, that's not going along with it. So what we do need to do now is get organized and to come up with a plan to fight back. And that's the, I'm glad you asked it because that's what I've devoted my life to for the past about 15 years is to implement such a plan. And uh, I'll, I'll try and keep this short. The, the uh, introduction to all of that would be something we call the Red Pill Expo, which is coming up as a matter of fact, in just about eight days. Uh, the Red Pill Expo is going to be held in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana on November 6th and 7th. It's the seventh expo. And what the expo is, is it's, it looks on the surface a lot like a conference, mm -hmm. except this one is all about red pills. Well, most people know the red pill meme. It stands for taking the red pill and breaking out of the illusion and seeing life the way it really is. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing at the Red Pill Expo. Is we talk about all these different illusions, some of which we've mentioned on the show here, but there are a lot more. It's not just banking and education and healthcare and all of that stuff. We've got a lady there who's a survivor of MK Ultra. There, there are illusions everywhere. The first thing is to get people together so they understand what they're up against and what, what is real and what is an illusion. But the most important part is now that we got that picture, what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And what we're creating now, uh, we call it Red Pill University. Now, it sounds like it's a an educational operation, but it really isn't. It's, it's educational, but it's action based upon ed, an education. Mm -hmm. And the action is at the local level. We are establishing campuses, we call them campuses, which are small groups of activists in every county in the United States and in other parts of the world as well. People who will make a difference, who will, who will make sure that we, and in the United States, make sure we've got a good constitutional sheriff elected, make sure that the people on the board of supervisors, the county board, are held accountable or replaced. We we'll make sure that we have good candidates for these offices, for mayor, city council, board of education, all of these things. These are very tangible things. We are moving to take back control of the system from the ground up, not from the top down. Everybody says, well, if we can just get somebody in the White House, if we can just vote Republican or Democrat and get a man in a white horse, you know, one man, we think if we get one man in the White House, that'll take care of everything. Hurrah, hurrah, it's over. No, no, no. We've, we've lost this battle from the ground up, not from the top down. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we're going to recapture it. So the short answer to your question is, uh, come to the Red Pill Expo, if you can, in person. Uh, and you'll find all the information at redpillexpo.org. And that's coming up in just a few days. Mm -hmm. If you can't make it, of course, many most people can't actually go. We have a very uh, modestly priced live stream. Be sure to tag into that because you'll see 
that'll be the doorway will open up to this Red Pill University that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You can go on the internet and, and jump right ahead to redpilluniversity.org if you wish, and you can learn all about this plan that I'm talking about. It's a very, we think it's a very well thought out plan and something that has never been tried before. And I'll give you a little teaser on that. We've borrowed a lot of tactics from our enemy. Our enemy is brilliant in, term of, in terms of organizing society. And uh, it, it's a natural organization. There's nothing wrong with the organization, but they've, they've figured out how to use it well. We don't want to adopt their, their morality, policy. their yeah. policies, I mean, their ethics. And I mean, they would lie, cheat, kill, steal, murder, you know, blow, blow up the planet in order to reach their goals. And we don't believe in deception or deceit. We're right out in the open, everything we do, which is, of course, they would never do that because if they told you up front what they were up to, oh, I, nobody would accept their plans at all. But with those two exceptions, we think what they've done is very brilliant, the way they organize you know, groups within groups and around groups and how they control political parties and all of that. So it's a big topic, but I'm glad you asked it because I'm sure that in your audience, there'll probably be 3%, 5% who are thinking, hmm, that sounds interesting. And maybe I should look into that. And that's all we need. All we need is that 1% of the thought leaders who really devote their lives to this, this crusade, who will influence and become the leaders of the 15% hardcore who will actually do the work and make it happen. That 15% can take back our liberty and move us beyond to where we were. I mean, we back at the formation of the, of the United States and the drafting of the Constitution was not the end of the road. It was really the beginning of the road. That was the first, that was the beta model of something that can be much better in the future. It's a great start. And we have to get back up to where we were. And then our plan takes us beyond that into the future. Mm -hmm. Now, that's meant to be a teaser. I hope it did arouse somebody's <laughs> curiosity. And uh, it's a very important topic. And I think people who feel that crusader gene like we do are going to respond to it. Before we get to the short answers, the, in the book, you have natural laws. And this is really relevant to what we're talking about in multifamily as far as inflation, and I guess, tax you talk about. And you talk also about monetary policy. Can you discuss a couple of the natural laws that you really feel are relevant, like fiat currency and the fiat money and the banking system, fractional banking? What should people really be focused on? And what would you like to discuss on the topic of the natural laws mm -hmm. in, the, in the book? Oh, well, that's, gee, nobody's ever asked me about my natural laws. And I haven't thought about them since I wrote the book. I'd have to go look them up. Uh, <laughs> I got the book. I got the book right here. Okay. Was, yeah. I, was I need, I need, I need the, second. I need the cliff notes on this so, one in my own book. Um, uh, well, you, I mean, the natural laws are great. Long, the first natural law is long-term price stability is possible only when the money supply is based upon gold. Third one, a nation that resorts to the use of fiat money has doomed itself to economic hardship and political disunity. That's what's going on right now, folks. That's going on. Yeah. Number look four, out the window. That's right. Number four, the fractional money will always degenerate into fiat money. It is but fiat money in transition. I love that. And natural law number five, when men are entrusted with the power to control the money supply, they will eventually use that power to confiscate the wealth of their neighbors. So okay. It's pretty prophetic. That, yeah. Well, they're simple, aren't they? Yes. I mean, <laughs> any, any uh, grade school kid could figure those things out if they mm -hmm. had the facts in front of them. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a banker. You don't have to be a graduate from the School of Economics or anything that's to figure these things out. If you're playing a game of a Monopoly and somebody is constantly printing $100 bills of Monopoly money, that's going to change the rules of the game considerably. <laughs> yeah. But Mr. Griffin, with all due respect, there's a lot of people out there that are truly intelligent and they're probably naive like you because when I mention fractional banking and I have an introduction in our academy, they look at it and go, I never really knew that. No. They don't know what banks are in, in business for. They don't know that $1 turns into nine or 10, they don't know that banks are charging you 3% and they're, they're getting your money at one. So they're making three times in their money. People don't understand it. They don't know the basics of economics. And that's the problem. And that's why you need to read The Creature from Jekyll Island because it discusses all of that. It's really, truly important. If you understand the banking system, make the bank work for you. You become the banker. You understand what's going on with inflation. You are, you know, invest in hard assets like real estate and whether it's silver or gold or any other assets that you can take advantage of. But I mean, the natural laws are, are greater. Anyone that stands out more that you really should say, hey, everyone, you need to look at this and, and be careful. Like the fiat one, the fiat currency, what can we do about fiat money and printing? They continue to print and print and print and degrade US dollar. What should we do? Well, that's a, that's a pretty easy question to answer because it's so simple. It's so simple that a lot of people miss it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're standing on a railroad track, and you look up and you see uh, about a thousand feet away, there's a locomotive and a train coming right straight at you, blowing its whistle. 
and you're standing on the tracks, what do you do? <laughs> yes, you, got, you, you better get off the darn tracks. <laughs> so if you're, if you're living in a system of fiat money and every, all of your savings and all of your assets, all of your, your ability to, to survive is in fiat money, that train is coming right at you. Uh, that money is deteriorating in its value by the minute, by the mm. second now. So what do you do? You convert it as quickly as possible into something else. Now that's now we get into a discussion of well, what would be best, and that depends on each individual. It depends on your aptitude. Depends on how much money you have, how, mu how much savings you have. Depends on your aptitude, your age. You know all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, but it all falls into one category. You got to get off of the track that fiat money is not where you want to be. Any place else would be better than being still on the track when the locomotive finally reaches your where you stand. And it's, it's not far away right now. It's getting closer and closer. <laughs> so uh, it's going uh, so, faster, and faster. Yeah, faster and faster. It's coming downhill. That train, down that train is coming. They're feeding it with the coal. <laughs> it's coming downhill, baby. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, then you get into a discussion of what's best for you and all of those things. I, the the, the no-brainer is um, bullion because, uh, and, and not numismatics, not expensive things that maybe are worth a million dollars because they're rare. That would be good if, you, if you've got yourself covered at the foundational level first, then you begin to, then you can dabble with art and, and very expensive collectible items, which is a good idea. But for the average person, they're just thinking, well, now I might need something to buy some food with or some some clothing or maybe to get out of town or bribe somebody who knows you need something to spend and um, and cr cryptos aren't going to do it because you're not going to not going to have a computer in your pocket or anything like that you need something tangible and that's what we talk about tangible assets so the no-brainer there is just bullion coin silver would be the most useful uh, gold coins of course carry a lot of value in them but if you want a loaf of bread, you don't want to buy it and give a gold coin to the guy and he can't give you any change. So you do need silver. I would start with that. But for people that have an aptitude in other things, they would be able to think of a lot of things other than gold and silver. Uh, I've often thought that it'd be a good idea to, to buy a, a warehouse full of cheap white wine. <laughs> you can always exchange a bottle of cheap white wine for something, you know, that you want. Guys, uh, we're missing the most obvious one right now. It's uh, brass. Uh, it's brass. Brass? 50, cents a, 50 cents a round, all right? He's talking it's about the easiest one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, we all saw it just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. People that had a lot of uh, boxes, huge boxes of toilet paper were rich, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Start thinking. What do you do? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be gold and silver, but it mm -hmm. needs to be tangible. It needs to be useful. Mm -hmm. And if it's tangible and useful, and there's a demand for it for something other than money or the medium of exchange, then it's an ideal money. I don't care what it is. Cigarettes have always been a good money in prison, you know, for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it need to read a little bit about what is the nature of money. Doesn't take much. And then you can figure it out for yourself. Thank you. All right, gang, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Are you looking for ways to improve your life? Here at Jake and Gino, our mission is to empower students through financial education and the vehicle of multifamily investing. Yes, Jake. We agree that a person with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. We've created our proprietary three-step framework, buy right, manage right, and finance right, that we teach to our community. This framework, along with education, our one-on-one -on -one mentorship, on-site boot camps, and the amazing community has propelled our students to massive success. We've all been there. We've had so many students that have been able to shift their mindset, overcome limiting beliefs, and set a clear path to achieve their goals. Whether you're currently fixing and flipping, wholesaling, or buying single family rentals, and you know that multifamily investing is the right vehicle for you, I encourage you to visit jakeandgino.com forward slash apply to schedule your complimentary consultation with our team and I want to let you know this isn't a high pressure sales call. It's really just a discovery call to get to know each other better and see if we're a good fit for working together. And if for any reason we're not a good fit, our team has tons of resources we will share with you to help you along your journey. If you're ready to stop spinning your wheels, go to jakeandgino.com forward slash apply and schedule your call now. All right, we're back. So the uh, the current administration in the United States is telling me that inflation is only negatively impacting the wealthy. Do you mind speaking on that topic for a second and let, letting us know who, if, uh, if, if not just the wealthy inflation may be impacting? Well, first of all, that statement is 
on the surface, absurd. And I can't imagine it. <laughs> I, I can't I've read it multiple places. <laughs> I know. So. Well, we're back to that thing. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Yeah, yeah. Beat you know? that drum, beat that drum. And people will start to believe it. But I can't imagine yeah. that anybody could believe it after they've heard it a million times. Because once you go to the grocery store, you know it, it's a lie. It's the average, it's when the prices of things go up, uh, like food and, and uh, clothing energy. and energy, Mm -hmm. uh, but does this affect the uh, wealthy people? I don't think so. I mean, they've got millions and billions of dollars. In fact, they're the ones that own the stores and the supply lines that you're buying all this stuff from. So they don't care. They're making their money. They're going to increase prices on, yeah. the, on the, the goods that they're selling. Yeah. So they're the, they're the best position to keep up with inflation. Yeah, they're the middleman on the, yeah. on the source. Yeah. So no, I'm not, I'm not anti-wealthy people. Don't get me wrong. I'm I, not like, I you know, I... I I, I like I'd like to be super wealthy. I think that'd be fine. I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I would change my lifestyle any or my attitude toward my fellow human beings. But uh, so that's not it. Uh, so anyway, first of all, it's absurd. It's an absurd statement, and it, it reinforces a concept that I think people need to hold, and that is, why would you believe anything that a politician tells you? Now just think about that. If an authority of some large institution like government or a corporation a large institution which commands great power and money. Why should you believe anything they say? Can you think of any time you, we that they've ever, masters. ever told the truth? Would yeah. you think about that? If it affect, if it's really important to you to be content and not question, they lie every time. So why I mean, don't people see that? No, and the answer, of course, they don't. I didn't either. So I'm just trying to be dramatic here in my in my statement. So stop listening to these people. And think for yourself. Now, does it affect the wealthy more than inflation more than the um, than the average person or the or the poor people? And obviously, no, that's not true. In fact, the wealthy people, the very wealthy people, have investment plans and they're involved in all kinds of institutional programs where they benefit from inflation. Um, banks benefit from inflation. So, if you're in a bank, you love it because they. Uh, they benefit from inflation. The more money there is, the more they can loan out, the more interest they can earn. And they're always ahead of this cycle. The, the consumers at the tail end of the cycle, the banker, the people that create the money and put it into motion are the ones that get full purchasing power of it before anybody realizes that it's just fresh made money. But once it goes and circulates to the society and it comes back around, now it has all the, the hand marks on it. And we realize, oh, this money has been handled by 300 and 704 people and it's it's purchasing power has declined every time it changes hands so now by the time it makes full circle uh one dollar buys three cents worth of goods you know mm -hmm. but when if you're at the beginning of that cycle you just benefit tremendously you don't care it's the suckers at the end of the line that <laughs> are the ones are the ones that pay mm -hmm. but when you put your freshly made money into the system it has full purchasing power so again you have to understand a little bit about how money is made and, and how, it, how it works. That's why I wrote, one of the reasons I wrote the book. Well, isn't it also that inflation, you, you, you write in the book, it's a hidden tax, it erodes savings, and it also leads to speculation. There's so much money out there right now that people are speculating and money needs, needs to find a return. So what they're doing there is they're bidding up these assets. And like you said, mm -hmm. the wealthy people own the assets. Inflation, hard assets, inflate, who wins? People mm -hmm. making twelve dollars an hour, they may, may maybe make fifteen dollars an hour, but guess what? Their rent is going up, so they're at a net negative. Whereas people who own hard assets are winning. So mm -hmm. I see it as, as clear as day, like you just described it. So yeah, um, we all have so, the. I'm sorry. So so the question is, why would why would the president make such an absurd? false statement because everything's okay guys because he has nobody challenging going. him there's nobody challenging him out there as far as the media as far as journalists no one is pushing back as far as economists no one is pushing back and saying is that is that really your people are actually this? buying this shit yeah it's yeah, crazy that, <laughs> and and obviously it's clear the reason that he's saying this is because there's been a uh, a lot of inflation it's not good for the common man and they're trying to win over the everyday citizen to think everything's hunky dory keep voting me into more power yeah big so, um, that my question was a rhetorical one of course yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah and first of all we have to realize that biden reads a script so who wrote the script yeah those so are the questions yeah. yeah. Well, it's not Biden. 
And let's just put it that way. It's, it's Oz, right? It's, the yeah. puppet master. It, yeah, the puppet master. And who is that? Well, That's we don't want to know. It, it's probably a team. It's probably yeah. an institutional thing. It's it's an organization. But uh, the 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 storyline, the party line, is always worked out ahead of time. And then they probably have a lot of writers that disseminate that storyline, not just to the politicians, not just to the president, the congressmen, the senators, but into the media as well. And because they have great, great influence and power through their money, uh, people read the script and they don't question it, mm-hmm. especially since well, everybody else is reading the script well, too. While you're, you're, you're in the herd, right? It's that herd yeah. instinct. Everybody's yeah. doing it, so it must be okay. Well, the next one up is we want to print three and a half trillion now. They've, they've lowered it to two. But it's going to cost nothing, and apparently this is going to have no <laughs> impact the on this one, bro. It costs no, but this nothing. Is, this is also going to have no impact in, on inflation, uh, unless you want to challenge that statement, Mr. Griffin. Costs <laughs> nothing. I love that. I, I love that. Well, that's on a, a par with uh, yeah, yeah. You will have no property. You will own nothing, and you will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> what? Happy? Uh-huh. Yes, you will be happy. Of course, if you understand what he's saying, uh, he's saying it, we will give you everything you need. That's the unspoken message. You will be happy because we will give you food. We will give you clothing, shelter, health care, and you will be happy because you will have everything you need. And then parentheses, so long as you obey, close parentheses. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the trick. Mm-hmm. That's why th- this is behind everything. And in fact, we're no longer playing the old inflation game where they just create money wildly because uh, it's profitable. They're now creating money even beyond wild. It's just absolute insane because they're trying to literally destroy what's left of the system. Mm-hmm. They want it to come crumbling down so that everybody, us included, will be on our hands and knees, especially our knees, begging for food clothing, shelter, medical care. And we will be so grateful to the government because they send us the checks and they give us a pass to go to the hospitals as long as we obey. That's the name of the game. That's the one thing so many people struggle with is that, gang, it's all about power. And then I struggled with this early on. It's like, why are these people doing this? They want to get rich. They want this. No, they are power hungry sickos. And that's what this is all about. And I think once people realize that, they'll, they'll understand that they're not messing around. This is what they're really after. Well, yeah. And uh, if you think that thing through this whole idea about money and power, there's only one of those two, and that's power. That's right. The only, the only reason people want money it's is because power. it gives them power. So it's really power. And if you, can env- if you can envision a system where there is no money, there are just social credits, let's say. Mm-hmm. You earn credits based on what you do and what your attitude is. And there's no money, just units, credit. Uh, so now nobody's making any money, but you have total power over others because you can determine how many credits they get or how many credits they surrender if they do something that they're not supposed to do. So it's no longer money in the classic. People classics. are no longer challenging them. And then now yeah. they're, they're, that's nirvana for these folks. Yeah, so. it's nirvana. Yeah, they can hardly wait. You can see it in their eyes when they talk <laughs> about this thing. They, they get this vision like, oh my God, we're almost there, guys. Let's go. Another couple of more years, we're going to have her locked down. Gentlemen, yeah. you know what the, the thing that bothers me the most about this whole situation for the last couple of years is when people are in authority or giving us laws, as in let's wear a mask, but then they go out without wearing a mask. We're going to shutter businesses. Then all of a sudden they go into a hair salon and they're opening Gino, up. Gino, why are themselves. you challenging your masters right now? I'm just saying that. And <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised that people, let's not go to our next house. But meanwhile, they go out of state and they go. That's what bothers and enrages me more than anything else. It's it's laws for us, but not for you. It's laws for thee, but not. That's what bothers me. And I, I wish more people would realize that and push back on that aspect of it. I'm not saying coronavirus is real or it's not real. I'm just saying the the after effects of what's going on. If you're telling me not to go out and to close my business, I'll do it for the greater good. But if you're not doing it and you're creating all the laws, that's where I see we need to push back at. Let's it be at least on par uh, with that. That's what's really enraged me on the situation other than you mentioned before about the goal. Oh well, yeah, it should enrage everybody, but it's, you know, people are conditioned to accept the privilege of the of their rulers. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of like, uh, well, it's like in England. I I had a chance to go to England for the first time a few years ago. And of course, I've seen all the pictures of the royalty and all that, the, the queen oh, on her going through a parade. But I actually, when I got there, I went to the palace 
And I'm in a, uh, now I'm in the throng out there in the street waiting for something. I didn't know what. I was waiting for the parade. Well, the parade finally came and down came all these strutting soldiers and their big hats and the, and the band playing. And then came the, the carriages with the fancy people in the carriage with their, their very fancy clothes and the jewelry and the big fancy hat. And then one carriage after another, another carriage, and then the, then the royal guard and everything. And then they go in through the big, huge gates into the palace and the gates close again. And the people are cheering, cheering over the fact that here is a sort of an elite group of people that are sort of above and beyond them that have all the privileges of the world. They live in a castle and there's the big gate and, the, and everything. They think it's fine that some people should live much better than they do. They have no problem with that because they were born into it and they were just conditioned to think, well, that's the way it is. You know, these are very special people. And, and if we didn't have them, why then maybe we wouldn't have anything. So I, Americans got to that point a long time ago. At first, they put movie celebrities into that category. They would stand in line for hours and hours to see a movie celebrity, you know, mm -hmm. like the people in England would stand in line and wait in the rain to see the queen come by. But to, to Americans, you know, if, if a, a movie star came by, would that be worth the wait? Mm -hmm. And But lately, it's sort of the politicians now. They're, they're mm -hmm. beginning to take on the role of royalty. I think Fauci was voted sexiest man alive or something last year. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> Who voted? I have no idea. <laughs> I think I think it was Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson. <laughs> All right. Okay, I got it. It makes more sense now, right? <laughs> yeah. That's that's a good point. <laughs> well, guys, there, there is some hope though because you mentioned celebrities and I was saying to Gino earlier today, I, I think some of the these guys, Bill Maher, John Stewart, Russell Brand that are tip, typically in the collectivist camp are starting to get a little worried about what's going on. And they're actually starting to speak out, uh, which is, it's a very positive uh, thing because typically those guys are just out in the line, right? Beating the drum, as, as we like to say. So seeing some of these people start to speak out against some of this, this woke uh, cancel culture stuff is, is encouraging. Like I'm not saying we're there by any means, but it's, it's good to see that because people do respond to these types of figures. So. Well, that's true. And that's, again, we're back to human nature. Because uh, very few people want to be the first person yeah, to do anything. Well, especially when they're cutting your head off now. Especially, yeah. especially when, yeah, when there's the henchman out right behind you with the big blade. Yeah. Um, but even without it, just to be uh, alone and to be the first one and people looking at you out of the you know, sides of their eyes, like, who is this jerk? Mm -hmm. He's stepping out of line. Stepping yeah. out of line, yeah. So nobody wants to be first or second. But by the time you get to the 10th or the 20th or the 100th or the thousands, all of a sudden, there are a lot of people that will come and join you because they're not alone anymore. We're well down that path right now. And I see the numbers increasing exponentially almost every day. Mm -hmm. So I too, am, I share your enthusiasm and optimism and encouragement over that one. Yeah. It could be any day that we would hit the tipping point. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Edward, what's the best way for listeners to get a hold of you or learn more about what you have going on? Well, the, the first place I would say is to go to uh, redpillexpo.org because that's where my life is totally focused right now. And then after that's through on the 7th, uh, then my focus will, will move over to redpilluniversity.org. So those are the two places to start. We have a free newsletter. It's called needtoknow.news. So I work hard on that. Uh, we publish three times a week. And we try and put our own analysis onto most of the stories that we publish. They're stories that you might see elsewhere, but you wouldn't have our analysis attached to them. And uh, we spend a lot of time trying to make that worthwhile. So that's needtoknow.news. I recommend that. And uh, those are the three places. If you want to really deep down and go down the, the rabbit hole, go to Freedom Force, <laughs> freedomforceinternational.org. And that's- You might find Alice down there. Alice is down there. Yeah. She's, she, she's waiting for you. <laughs> and so is the Mad Hatter. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right, Gina, bring us home here. Jake, you mind? Give me one minute to recap Mr. Griffin's life. Of course. Born in 1931, in the height of the Great Depression, which means he probably was didn't have the Crusader Gina then, probably just going around and looking to authority. Born during a tough time, was a childhood actor. Went to the University of Michigan for speech and communication, then went into the army, became a writer. And I think that's where he got his crusader gene. I mean, written countless 
books, countless articles, and always at the, 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 the tip of the spear, as they like to say, and, and my reading his books and, and reflecting back on what he's done and always being the one out front, being the one being denigrated and being called a crazy person, that takes a lot of courage. And for those of us out there, standing we standing alone to, at times. Yes. We need to dig deep down inside of us and, and really whatever we truly believe. And I, I have admiration for my wife. My wife is one of those where she stands out. She's been yelled at. She's been told that we're crazy. And you really need to open your eyes and look what's going on in the economy. Read the creature from Jekyll Island. It's there. You may not agree with it all, but you're seeing what's going on. And if you look for the last 30 to 40 years, the degradation of the dollar with what's going on with inflation, with the powers that be, with the control, with the shutdowns and with what's going on, flatten the two-week curve. We can continue to go on and on. At one point, you have to start asking the right questions. Let's start asking the right questions and let's start challenging authority and let's start thinking clearly. And let's start trying to be the tip of the spear. Like Mr. Griffin said, we only need 15%. That's all you need is 15% to start the revolution and to start taking back what's right. I just want to thank right you for coming on and for, for sharing your story with us. And you know, it's, it's been an honor. This is the second time you've had it on the show. And every time we have you on, I just gleam a ton of knowledge from you. So I just want to thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Well, thank you. You're very kind. And I, I can see you guys have got your crusader gene rapidly vibrating also. So if you're right. 15% is all we need. And I think we've already got that. Now we just have to get organized. Mm -hmm. Great. Edward, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank talk, you. To you talk to you next time.